Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. We uh, are doing a Q&A today with Othias. I saw that. I saw that. Well, tell me, Tom. You're you're wearing a uh, a pseudo Forgotten Weapons shirt, aren't you? No. Yeah. There's other people out there with, uh, well, 70s mustaches and <laughs> no, um, no some part. sort of chin puck. <laughs> Where did, did the... Um, did you select that hairstyle or did it select you? Oh, oh ouch. No, that's okay. I've seen your dad. Well, I have a cool cool t-shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, patented plastic pokey t-shirt. Oh, uh, okay, hold on. <laughs> now it's on. Okay, here they're blue. Ah, uh -huh. All right. This, now you have no excuse. By the way, both of these uh, were one-offs made by awesome Forgotten Weapons viewers. Oh. So... Wait, uh, individually? Yes. Wait, yeah. why did an awesome Forgotten Weapons viewer send you... Because he heard I was going to be doing a collaboration with you. Oh, and he's like, this would be the funniest, coolest thing. I'll send you one. Um, and he did. Thank you, Alex, by the way. That is awesome. You can keep that. But... Oh, cool. You can keep that. This is horribly awkward. Okay, so <laughs> we have a... So, yes, this is a, a Q&A video. Okay. Um, I didn't want to spoil the surprise that we were doing a collaborative thing... So I asked my awesome patrons on Patreon uh, for questions about World War One because that, of course, has been your focal point for the last, like, four years. Right. Um, and the next one? You're getting um, close to the end. We have managed to plan out all of 2019 in terms of loans or pieces nice. that we believe we can have operational by the end of the year. So Fantastic. things like that column blame behind you. Um, you know, we, we know blow up on the range and, and mm -hmm. all those guys, and they have a solution for that, but we're still trying to find a cosmetically correct one that really, we're okay. being picky. Okay. But there's stuff like that that could be done, but it could be done a little bit better, so it's getting kicked down the road. And then, yes, I'm aware that the U.S. had a handgun of some sort. We'll get to it later. Did they? It's not worth mentioning, I'm really. pretty sure that we went into the war without a handgun. We just borrowed rubies. There's some the fantastic hands. revolvers that we're talking about very soon. So it occurs to me that there are probably at least a couple of you guys who don't know who this dude is. <clears throat> um, uh, Othias runs, or co-runs, uh, Sea and Arsenal, which is a really cool gun channel out there uh, that does fantastically in-depth episodes on specific firearms. And you got kind of tied in early on uh, do with The Great War. Yes. Doing, like, The Great War, which you also ought to watch if you haven't already. They've kind of finished their thing, but all the videos are out there, of course. Um, they were based in Germany, and they didn't really have a way to do guns. They weren't gun people. They right. didn't have access to them. Their parent company was basically scared of guns. And so you got connected in as, like, the gun side of the Great War. Sort of. It actually was something that we pushed for. So they contacted us about uh, licensing image use, or at least hmm. for permissions. And so, because I was doing articles at the time, and what they didn't know is that I was gearing up for video... Although we were going to have more of a World War II emphasis, but then just sort of do whatever we wanted. We were just going to do in-depth gun history in general. And so when they said, well, we're doing this World War I series, I went, you know, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with World War I arms, well enough to sort of name the major powers and what they had, and a few obscure things like Serbian guns and Romanian guns. I didn't know a bit of that. So I was like, yeah, it can't be that hard. It's not going to be as hard as World War II. How hard could it be? Yes. How <laughs> hard could it be to have all the weapons of some of the last imperial powers? So I stupidly said, you know, I'll just track along with you guys. I'll start doing a World War One series specifically. And then a combination of OCD and determinedness stuck in because we kind of made a game of seeing how many World War One guns we can really cover because when you get to the point that you start getting into the weeds... Sometimes you find surprisingly interesting history. There are guns yeah, that absolutely. I never heard of that tell really fantastically weird stories. And Othias isn't going to say this about himself, but I'll say it. Um, when I do a video, I generally kind of cover the surface level of the history and, and where the gun came from and where it was used. Um, CN Arsenal goes far more in-depth, and they also shoot every single gun that they have. I think there's there's... I mean, there are a few things that you might not be able to shoot, right? but we're talking really, really esoteric, weird stuff. Yeah, so. we have a plan for if we get to the end and we just yeah. really want to talk about guns we haven't been able to borrow, but we've, we've tried very hard and succeeded in many ways to borrow some stuff that I did not yeah. think was possible. So um, it, that's been a big team effort, though. So at some point, we need to get into the Q&A here. So I will cut this short by saying, if you have not watched CN Arsenal, you absolutely should go watch CN Arsenal. 
Um, if you are a history nerd, gun nerd, mechanics enthusiast, you will find a lot of very interesting stories in the history of World War I firearms. So there is naturally a link in the description below for the CN Arsenal channel on YouTube. Uh, he does also have a Patreon account, and if you're looking for someone cool to support, that's a good one. I do. You should, too. Uh, now, I have a bunch of questions here. Yeah, that, that is rather thick. Yes. Uh, hopefully we'll get to all of these, but we'll see. Um, we're going to start with the ones that were actually uh, asked by more than one person. And a lot of these were asked by a bunch of people, so I figured we'll touch on them first um, before we talk about the real collaboration that we did here, which is way bigger than just a QA. and I was going to say, this is releasing first, correct? Yes. So yeah. by the time you're seeing this, if you're new, if it's just come out, uh, there's been a lot of push for us to do a collaboration. Yes. This is not the collaboration. I, we want to make sure that we're very clear. We did not take the time to get together and leave you hanging with just a Flew down here, did a Q&A, went home. The end. Right. No, uh, we, we put a lot of work into this one. Uh, we are, today, we are off of 12 hours at the range. I saw something like that. two whole hours. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're going to get the interesting answers. Yeah. So our first question, uh, why did the Madsen light machine gun not see production or more service during World War One? Uh, I'm going to try to keep these simple, by the way. There's okay. there's nuance to be found, and that's generally our, our bread and butter. But the biggest reason is uh, the Danes didn't want to sell them. They, just, okay. they didn't want to sell them to mostly the, the interest was in the central powers, but they're trying to stay neutral. And uh, mm -hmm. there's actually, and I'm just digging into this, I don't have a lot of references to back it up, but there's claims that there was even a shipment that was supposed to go to then still vaguely neutral Bulgaria that then was seized by Germany slash Austria-Hungary and mm. sort of disseminated to get even more Madsen. So they already knew they liked the system, and they would have probably happily bought quite a few. They just weren't going to be getting any because why would we sell machine guns to people who are engaged in a war? This is a very odd notion. And I actually need to dig in deeper before, but we got an episode that's going to come up and I, I'm going to really get into it. But as far as I understand it, that's where it was. But people will say, well, obviously, I mean, that's such a stupid decision. There's an incredible amount of money to be made selling guns to one side or both sides. Look at the United States, for example, made a boatload of money in World War I doing that. On the other hand, for a small country like Denmark that is right in the middle of the fray there, I think there's a very powerful argument to be made that no amount of money you could make for a private company, by the way, selling machine guns to one side would be worth it if it got your now neutral country embroiled in the war and in deep uh, bad stuff. I mean, we've seen, we've seen countries that were invaded because the other side might invade them. That's that's a thing yeah. that has happened. I think yeah. selling machine guns is another possible problem. So, uh, next question. Uh, and from a bunch of people who have clearly not watched your video on the Pedersen device. <laughs> How amazing would the Pedersen device have been in combat? Like, we all know it's there. It is a conversion of the 1903 Springfield to a semi-auto 40-round capacity pistol caliber carbine. And man, you could jump out of the trench and just pop, 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 pop on, you know, 200 rounds per soldier. And it is such a shame that the war ended before the spring offensive of 1919 could actually bring that into service, right? Yeah, I mean, all we were going to, I mean, who doesn't want, in the middle of a battlefield, a 10-pound 32 ACP semi-automatic rifle that vaguely functions like well now wait a minute you're not making it sound very good now no, well, i mean it's slightly <laughs> better than 32 acp but we're we're in that cat. we're not even getting nine millimeter out of this thing no it's a it's a novel concept i granted that i don't know that the sort of changing of bolts is ever going to be a super reliable wartime thing for an individual soldier that's that's not very good and then the gun itself uh we've played with one that we did some minor repair on and, and got running pretty well but the i've been into the geometries of that gun they're not good and i felt <laughs> a lot better when our friend andrew who does a lot of u.s archival work came to us and he said we have all these records from 1919 through 1925 ish where they're retesting these things that have come back from not being used and they're just garbage like they're just <laughs> the failure rate is astronomical the parts breakage is astronomical the way that things are put together they there's every possibility of a jam. There's every possibility of a breakage. It's trying to pack a pistol into... This is what you're, you're building a pistol that fits inside of the breech of another gun. Right. Is what you're doing. 
And imagine trying to get a handgun that small that would work that reliably. It's not going to go over very well. The exact phrasing you used when we were talking about it earlier was they built a pistol caliber carbine inside the size profile of a Springfield Bolt. Yeah. Which, when you think about it that way, is a phenomenal mechanical achievement. Oh, it's... It, it doesn't quite work. It's still a pretty phenomenal achievement, even not quite working. I, I, but, Pedersen's MO of just sort of like, can I get the parts to move? Can I get them to stack? And then reliably, reliability is like way over here. Like the actual, like it, it works in theory, so therefore it must apply. Now, uh, in terms of whether it would be cool or not, I actually have a going theory that if we had made it into 1919, we may have actually seen this sort of U.S. exceptionalism and small arms technology that we talk about all the time. We might have seen that fade. Um, we have a mutual friend, uh, the archivist that I met, who is even thinking of working on a, a book, and I was pushing for him to do this because almost every U.S. small arm for World War One actually had a flaw of some sort, uh, not not simple ones either. And by the way, we see this with other nations. So it's not unique to the U.S., it's just that we sort of act like the U.S. had the best and the best and the best. Eh, don't always don't always believe every secret weapon or every yeah. whatever is going to be perfect. There is something to be said for having four years of actual combat experience to hone your your ability of to, to produce what actually works in the field. Right. Even like the 1917s had huge, serious problems when they first came in. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then ammunition problems and other things. And, yeah. uh, again, I don't want to give too much away of some things that I've heard that I would like somebody to publish, please. So, What's his company? People uh, can go and like hire him to dig up interesting things out of the U.S. archives. Yeah, uh, I think we'll just put uh, just a link below because it's Archival Research Group, which is suitably generic. So it's I think we can probably... difficult to Google. Yeah. So. All right, we'll have a link to that in the description as yeah. well. <clears throat> He's helped me out with some... Uh, oh. U.S. documents on the French RSCs. If well. I could get him to be in front of a camera, you know what I mean? Like, he does yeah. a great job. All right, uh, next question. Okay, so now, now that you've poo-pooed all over the Pedersen device, what about everyone's next favorite <clears throat> U.S. World War I awesome weapon, the trench shotgun? Okay, uh, so... Oh, specifically, I, I had a number of people who asked, basically, how awesome is that? And then I did have one specific one of, did the Germans really threaten to execute anyone who was caught with one of those things? Okay, so this is a lot. This is a whole episode that we haven't done, and we started one. So actually, if you reach over there, right, right there. Hey, hey. Right? And look then, at that. It's a trench shotgun. Ooh, it's a trench shotgun with a wood handguard on it. I reach over here. Now, that's a reproduction handguard at the moment. That is a real shotgun that was never trimmed down like most of them were from Remington. And then I've got the Winchester written here, although somebody bobbed the hammer and cleaned up the stock a bit too much, so this has got to get fixed, but this will be in another episode of ours. Um, we have the 97 and the 10. Well, these are the only two trench shotguns. Uh, that's okay. that's one thing that people don't understand right off the bat. Uh, the Model 12 was purchased in small numbers for training and probably guard duty, but in terms of bayonet mounting guns, uh, these are really just considered shotgun with bayonet mounts. They don't think of them as trench guns. Um, and I'm going through a lot of documentation, and we keep mentioning this guy because he's so handy, but anything U.S. is going to come through him, and you guys are asking U.S. questions, that's why. But we're going through a lot of documentation right now to unpack what was once a very oral history and is now one that we're exploring through memo. And in many ways, the uh, internal ordinance memos are pointing in an entire different direction than what's been recorded, and then every once in a while, it kind of snakes back in. But the short answer is the Germans did absolutely go after these guns in terms of trying to drive them into being a political issue. But you got to understand, <clears throat> Germany had been facing all sorts of political accusations. So they had the sawback bayonets. That was an early one. Yep. And the idea was that having a sawback on the bayonet, which really was meant for you to be able to give some engineers some usage to give yeah. them a saw. It really legitimately <clears throat> was. Yeah, it wasn't just the Germans that did it. A lot of people. Oh, yeah. No, it was common. But then the idea is it became the butcher's bayonet, right? right. And then um, we had poison gas, obviously, the thing people are not into, and the rape of Belgium that people were not into. There's, there's all this Flame pressure yeah, yeah, on them being terrible. But then you see it the other way. They, they, they accused the British of where the magazine cutoff was on the short magazine Lee Enfield. Is a, there's a hollow from the way they roll the steel. That's right. And the accusation was, and I've actually found German footage of the time showing how the British obviously would take their bullets and put them in there 
and snap them off in order to make dum-dums, and this was obviously condoned by the government because they provided the means to make a dum So it's all fluff, you know what I mean? In terms of executions, I don't know that one's ever been recorded. We've been looking to see if we can prove one. Um, it was probably well, just a big huff and puff to make it look like they're not the only ones doing weird stuff in the battlefield. And it's not like a lot of these actually made it into combat. No, um, we have to pack out a lot of information before I can make claims, but it looks like the usage numbers are far, 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 I mean, astronomically fewer than anybody has ever thought. And I'm giving a lot away, but the general consensus... Save some stuff for the... Uh... No, 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 no. The general consensus on these things is that they were garbage. And that all came down to paper ammunition, and then later they had brass ammunition that was unreliable for separate reasons. But if you can imagine an unwaxed paper cartridge... In a trench, it, that sounds great. Yeah, uh, even just the humidity of the mm -hmm. battlefield would yeah. swell up. So you get your one round off... And that was it. They were they were pretty much loathed because of just the ammunition problems. Makes sense. All right. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, when and I got this one from a lot of people as well, and it kind of surprised me. This was not a question I predicted people would ask. Um, when countries reissued black powder arms, did they make new black powder ammo, or did they work up smokeless substitute loads? Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, we definitely <coughs> saw right away, because the Portuguese Kropatschek was adopted at the, the dawn of smokeless, they immediately go over to a smokeless cartridge. Um, <clears throat> there were lightened smokeless loads for probably the Austrian guns, as far as I can tell. Um, and then I'm trying, I'm struggling, because I remember very distinctly, I just read that they had done a rework. But uh, there are countries where it's definitely noted that they never got around to it, that they just couldn't figure out what would work well. Uh, this one that stands out is I know definitively that they did not for the Mauser 71 rifles, so that's okay. right side locking only. Mm -hmm. They were just like, we're just sticking with black powder. Uh, we're only using it for emergency use anyway. So generally, I would think it was more often that they would actually not even produce all that much ammunition and just pull from long-standing reserves of black powder because, remember, this is a period where a lot of guns got updated in the 1870s era and then were immediately obsolete within a decade. Right. And they had stockpiled tons of ammunition because there's this European arms race and some latter <clears throat> colonialism. And so they had all this stuff, but there never was, I mean, you, you can't really think of a lot of 1870s large, 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 well, I mean, there's a few, but not to the scale of like well, you've got consuming all that ammo. So right. there's a lot of reserve in black powder, especially for rifles that weren't used on the front line. They were used for rail guards to have two rounds to chase off anybody that might come around and try to, you know, throw a bomb onto a rail line. Right. You've got guns like the 7184, guns like the Gra, were never actually used in a major war. Right. That ammo never went anywhere. I mean, famous guns, but yeah. not, not really fielded. Yeah. All right. Now, we're going to get into questions from specific individuals. Antigonus says, World War I showed the use of rifle grenades, with, mm -hmm. which most militaries used during the war, but always with adapters. Why was it not until decades later, after World War II, in fact, the integral rifle grenade launchers were incorporated into rifle designs? Well, to my knowledge of military history, you really don't see integrated uh, rifle grenades. In t I mean, there, there's always an exception. But generally, it's when you have an emphasis on infantry versus mechanization, especially light armor. And then even attempts at taking on heavy armor. And so World War II, everybody thinks of, you know, the bazooka. You know, everybody thinks of... Panzer track or whatever, you have this, this big tube over your shoulder or however you hold it, and it's the it's the lone infantry against the big old tank, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have this development of shaped charge and all these other things. And what, especially with like, I think you would know this from the French side, they start going, well, wait a second, we could just integrate, uh, you know, a grenade launcher, have very tight setting shaped charge, and we can have, you know, small infantry teams that are capable of at least, right. at least damaging and very much hurting you know, lines of armor. This is a very inexpensive way to dissuade armored yeah. attack. Yeah, and it gives frontline infantry a weapon immediately at their disposal. You right. don't have to wait for the guys with the cannon or the guys with the bazooka to, to get to wherever your tank is. And to my understanding, mm -hmm. the integrated grenade launcher generally gives you more control. Like, you have a much more standardized, yeah. like you have a standardized cartridge or load, you have the adjustments there. When you're dealing with World War One, you're really just harassing with grenades. I mean, it's not that they weren't designed to kill, but it was this sort of this general, let's keep hammering this and softening up this area and harassing this area. So this emphasis on like precision, whatever, is 
Yeah. It was by the end of the war that they were getting into combined arms, small unit mm-hmm. tactics, where you would have a couple guys with rifle grenades. Um, but there wasn't, there weren't anti-armor grenades. And because this developed during World War One, I, I think part of the issue was let's take the hand grenade and adapt it to rifle launching, which is not really going to give you the same thing as a grenade designed for an integrated launcher. Yeah, it's interesting because the World War One rifle grenade is. How can we throw a grenade much farther? That's really, right. that's the whole concept. I want to throw a grenade further. The post-World War II rifle grenade, again, is I don't really want to carry a bazooka. Like, yeah. it's, exactly. it's a different background on why they were using them. Yeah, and so the grenades take a different form because of their different intended function. Uh, Stephen, or Stefan, uh, says, How are territorial armies supplied with weapons? Were they part of the standard supply chains, or did they have to supply their own weapons? Does this leave any room for variation or specialized gear for these forces? Mainly thinking of British colonial forces, but French or others are also applicable. So this one is going to be, it varies. Um, It depends on if you have, like, I mean, think of Germany. They had a really hard time supplying any of their imperial troops. So when we think of Vladal Vorbeck, we think of him capturing everything in sight. As a matter of fact, he ransacked the Portuguese for weapons. And then interestingly... British supplies, trying to get them to the front, you actually see, you know, Union South, that well, one, Union South, but South Africa is pulling um, the Garo rifles, buying them from Portugal because they're there and the AM was available in theater because it's that or ship it out and waste all that movement of material that we need to put somewhere else. Right. So a lot of colonial stuff in World War I is ad hoc. It's what do we have on hand? And what can we make do with? Um, in some ways, you know, you get out into the east and stuff like that, you have a chance to have powder factories at least, not necessarily Africa. And so that can do a lot to sort of sustain, especially older types of ammunition, because it's a lot easier to manufacture that older stuff than this very sort of volatile and picky, smokeless stuff. So it's a mix. It depends. Okay. Um, British and India, they had a lot of support natively, and they just stuck with older patterns and updated when they could. That's... That's a much more built-up colony, though. I think Africa is really what we're thinking of in this regard. And that's just, we'll grab everything we can grab. The Germans were mostly, they started with mostly Mauser 71s. Um, The Belgians in that region were shipping in Gras single-shot rifles that they were given by the French. They were shipping them in because it still beat what they had, which I think were still like Albini Braveland. Yeah. Um, The French are a little bit unique in this question in that they were pretty much the only nation to have colonial armies fighting in the Western Front. Um, And what they typically did was one of two things. The guys who were fighting got frontline, standard-issue, first-class rifles. Um, African or Southeast Asian French colonial units that that were brought into the Western Front were using um, Berthiers or Lavelles. A lot of those units, though, were also used as labor battalions. And they really weren't, they literally weren't armed. They were there to build and maintain roads. Things that people underestimate. It's not like... It, part of it is we don't trust these people with real frontline combat duties, but part of it also is this has to be done, and someone's going to do it. And so given our proclivities via race, we're going to have these people do it. And it, um, by the way, beyond race, you know, not primary language, yeah. uh, do you want to command troops that have, you know, you're unsure of their background, you're unsure what they even understand. Uh, you're unsure of the context that when you say, I want this, does that have the same context? However, dig that ditch, you can sit there and watch them dig the ditch correctly or incorrectly, and it's far less consequential. And I should also point out, uh, colonial troops in some cases were absolutely ferocious and, and exceptional troops. Oh, yes. Um, and the ones who were tended to suffer the highest casualties because they were thrown into the front everywhere they needed shock troops. So, uh, let's see. Next up is from William. This is one that I suspect you get a lot. Um, I always see the same pictures of cut-down pistols used by tunnelers. Uh, Were rifles cut down into pistols actually something that was somewhat common, or uh, did I just get some weird one-time deal? So, actually, this appears in a couple movies is where this starts to come from in terms of people understanding it. But you got to understand two separate concepts here. Mm -hmm. One is the Obrez, which is sort of in Battlefield 1, the game, and people really identify with, like, people love Obrez pistols. 
Um, that's much more of a partisan, yes. Soviet, like, you're not allowed to have a gun, well, nuts to you, I'm going to saw off the first thing I can find is to get my pocket. The only reason right. you can have an Obrez is because the Imperial Russian government and therefore armies fall apart, and rifles end up scattered everywhere, and they're not gathered up appropriately, right. and so now you have rifles laying around, and then later in the World War II era, You've got people cutting them down to obscure them and use them because they've been right. sitting around. And I think it's worth pointing out that if you were able to bring back and interview every single person who ever actually made one of those and carried it and said, I will trade you that for any pistol, every single one of them would immediately take any pistol you offered them. Right. That's why they did it. There's nothing inherently good about a bolt-action rifle cut down to be this long. It's a homemade liberator is what... It's exactly, did. yeah. So... <clears throat> Discounting the Oprez, we do have shortened rifles, which has actually come up before. Mm -hmm. I know of, again, we're back to the number two, uh, I know of two indications of these guns, and that's mm -hmm. all I know of. I know of tons of claims. I have found zero photos. Okay. I have found zero paperwork, essentially. But one of Skinnerton's books, who does a lot of Lee Enfield work, mm -hmm. has noted an account from a field armorer who was asked to take an already damaged Lee Enfield rifle and convert it for use in the tunnel. So actually, this is a good point of evidence. And we're actually hoping to do a video on this sort of thing. Oh, cool. And he did note, he noted, we cut the barrel to this length, we refitted a front sight, and then they removed the rear sight and they notched the clip bridge so hmm. that they would have a V-notch rear sight. So it had a stock, it had a front and rear sight, it was not an Obrez, it was a shortened gun. Okay. And we know of this one, he doesn't say I did six more, he just mentions doing one. And then up at the Springfield Armory National Historic Site, they have a US 1917 that was found in German possession that had been shortened up to actually about an inch under the legal limit now. Um, and then our friend Jay has made a reproduction of that just over the legal limit, but with the sights in the same position. And I have actually uh, managed to shoot one of those. The problem is there's no provenance other than we found it in 1919 sitting in a German arsenal. So did the Germans capture it and then one of their tunnelers decide to turn it into something? Was it just done on a whim because it was captured in any equipment, so nuts to them? And maybe the barrel was bent. Or was it done by a U.S. tunneler and then... Yeah, it, right. it could be anything. But we period-wise, it probably happened on the battlefield, and then we know of at least one named example. So, yeah, they existed, but lots of things exist. I mean, I know right. of at least one photo of a Belgian you know, road guard with a double-barrel shotgun. That doesn't double-barrel shotguns weren't <laughs> issued, and it's probably one of four in all of Belgium that somebody bothered to put on their shoulder versus being able to get a hold of a rifle. You know, it's like there's that picture of the Marine in, um, I think, Fallujah, going up a staircase with a PPSH-41. Yeah. And in 100 years, someone will find that picture again and go, oh my god, the yeah, Americans were... were so, like, it'll be, they were short of arms, so they were issuing captured stuff, and their M16s were jamming, so they were issuing captured stuff, and who knows what other theories will come yeah. out. Uh, when in reality, it's one dude who went, hey, this is cool. I'll try this. You really want, like, two or three confirmed points of data for this stuff. Um, and it, people don't like that. They like to hear half of a rumor of an oral history, and yeah. then they like to run away with it. Because it sounds cool. Don't give me that. It sounds cool. And oh, we are, don't sound cool. We're going to cut oh, Short rifles sound cool. Yeah, short rifles, to me, I don't want to know, Brent. But, um... We're going to talk about it, though, because we did have a documented case, and we do have... Okay. Someone actually donated to us a very, very poor condition. The Angel is, is gone. And so we're going to actually try okay. to replicate what we believe this would have been, and then we have Jay's replication. So we're, we'll talk oh, about really it. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Gregory says, If the war had gone on longer, especially into 1919, with all the new weaponry that was planned, such as the Pedersen device, the BAR, the Browning 1919... The RSC 1918 carbine, the MP18, the Villa Perosa, and several others I've no doubt missed. How do you think strategy for the battle would have changed, if at all? Uh, would you think there would have been more breakthroughs of trenches? I'm going to take the easiest road on this is to say strategy would not change. Because by then we're in combined arms, and that's why these things are developed. The, the reason they're finally appearing is because it's finally been knocked into the head enough that they need a different type of weapon system because there really isn't so much innovation in World War One as you would think in terms of small arms, except for the emergence of simpler manufacturing, 
especially submachine guns. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, that's really it. We're still I using a lot of very strongly milled, you know, it, you're not even seeing incremental adjustments. You're not even seeing people go, you know, this gun did have a barrel sight for, for very little effort. We can put a rear aperture. Not even a no. lot of that's going on. It's, it's just mass production. And then the only reason to start producing anything different was because you were hoping to help exploit your new combined arm strategy and just sort of oppress and move. Um, and I know a lot of people, I should probably make this point too, a lot of people say, do small arms really matter? Yes, in the, in the sense that all the artillery, all the gas, all the planning, the, the recon with the planes, the use of tanks, all this other stuff, <laughs> remember, it's all there to support the movement of infantry who are the only ones that can actually take and hold and move the battlefield. And so you can say, does an incremental change in small arms really mean anything? It's like, in terms of a few personal lives, it means a lot because a slightly more usable gun means there's a slightly higher chance that person is going to succeed and live. But also, yeah, you're, ultimately your infantry is what that, takes the battlefield. That adds up. Yeah. yeah. I would add in that there, aside from the effectiveness in, at a tactical level, there were elements of trench warfare that were changing very substantially. And you have things like um, the German transformation from let's make this fixed, like three lines of, of trenches and they can't possibly punch through it. And we've got a, a ton of wire and guys at the front. And if they break through the first line, then we've got more machine guns at the second line. And as by the latter stages of the war, they realized that that was a foolish way to try to defend. And so instead they developed this more flexible approach where we let the, the attacking force in we let them pass the first lines, and then we basically surround, chop them into pockets, and destroy them with machine guns in this dead zone. And that the, the changes in those overall strategies can have much more effect than the individual small arms being used. So like if you had a group of Americans with BARs and 1919s running, attacking a, a Hindenburg line set of fortifications, but if they're not, if they don't understand what they're attacking, their better small arms aren't going to help them. They're still going to fall victim to the the intention of that that you know envelopment defense. So, it could have had small changes, but not necessarily. No, I don't. It's not think an automatic. Thing. Most of the wonder weapons of World War One, like we said with the Pedersen device, were not going to go as far as they. Go. I think probably the one weapon I say that did not get to make its mark, that really would have changed. Because, you know, everybody says, what if the BAR got out there? And you're like, it'd be slightly better in some ways and slightly worse in other ways than the show shot. It's, yeah. it's not. But uh, the German MV-18. Yep. That, that is a guys. gun that did not make, it did not have time to make the impact it should. And after I've handled one, that we've actually been rebuilding one, and we're going to be doing an episode. So cool. we have one that's mm -hmm. the property of the show, actually. Um, and we're trying to do some investigation with it because not a lot of people are shooting these. There's no yeah. buffer system. There's no nothing. But when we really got into it, we found there's not really as much milling on that gun as you'd think. It was actually very advanced in terms of rapid manufacture. So that part of it is really more important than the infantry use is could they crank out a ton? And there's more manufacturing in the magazine of that gun than there is in the rest of the gun. And <laughs> yeah, so if they could just crank sense. those out, Oh man, uh, that's that's where the game changers are. It's just in terms of just adding volume of fire. Yeah, and, yeah, and you see that after the war, the things that really get developed after the war are tanks, airplanes, light machine guns, and submachine guns. Uh, our next question is from Daniel: uh, Were any of the auto-loading firearms available in 1914 or 1915 suitable for military purposes in the trenches, assuming all the logistics get sorted out? Like, could the could the guns themselves? have worked. Presumably a follow-up question is if yes, why didn't they use them? <coughs> so we've got some stuff like the does Remington it, 8. Does it, yeah, does that say specifically military cartridge? Because that's the, that's the hang-up. So doesn't specify. The stuff that worked wasn't military cartridge. It, it's weird, but to make the jump to say 30-06 or 8mm Lebel seemed to be a huge leap in terms of making a functional, reliable gun. In a lot of cases, yeah. by the time they got there, they realized they didn't even want to be there. So World War II, again, we talk about World War II, they're notorious for these big, full-powered semi-automatic rifles. 
And then <clears throat> immediately after that, like, what if we just went with an intermediate cartridge? Which, by the way, is a step almost back because when you talk right. about like Remington 88 or Remington 8 or the, um, we talked about the Winchester 1907 yep. in 351. We talked about that and gun. the 1910 as well. Yeah. Those are approximating intermediate cartridges. Yeah. And they work very well at that level because you get the rapid fire, the rapid follow up. <clears throat> Those guns were thrown into airplanes. They didn't, even put them, they, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't put them on there. I mean, there's hints that they might have put them on the ground, but they really didn't. Must not if it, if they did, they didn't write it down. And it didn't show a lot of impact. So it's more likely that they just kept them in the air. So do you think they could have been effective? I think on so. The ground? I think I think it was a. I they probably knew that they couldn't just introduce that logistical nightmare, which is that I don't think you're going to get wartime production of the Remington Model Eight to a reliable enough standard. The, the okay. serviceability is too low on that gun. They're great guns, and individually, would I want one? Well, yeah, but I know how to take care of it versus the average soldier. And so if you could have simplified and been prepared ahead of time, okay, maybe. But, you know, if you're familiar with, like, the Garens, we had them before World War II, and they're still a lot of 1903s that had to get put together or yeah. you know, pulled out of inventory because just trying to scale what we were already doing for a semi-automatic rifle 20 years after World War I. Like, and it, to that point, it's worth pointing out that the reason, it's primarily the French that use these things. And I think it's largely, be, correct me if I'm wrong, it's largely because they had a lot of them around. Because Manu France, this gigantic catalog-based, like a Sears Roebuck and company, stocked Winchester self-loaders and... I don't know if they did so much Remingtons, but they had Winchester self-loaders that the well, French were able to immediately get. The bigger important is that they had the contacts. So they they, yeah. they had people on the ground in the U.S. that were buying agents that probably came from these organizations that had existed yeah. before. And so these guys would start saying, do you want this? Do you want that? But, you know, it's it's interesting. We're about to, you know, this year talk about, quote, unquote, the Remington Mall Lake. We have one on the back wall somewhere, but it doesn't really belong there. Because what really went out is what you see above your head. That's the FN 1900. That's true. And they bought like 100 of them. So a lot of these things get overblown. Yeah. Um, what they did buy thousands of are, you have a Winchester 1907 with a French magazine right there. This is probably the best you could have done. A blowback, yep. simple, rugged. This gun actually probably could have survived a war zone, except for at the rear here. It gets a little complicated and finicky, but it could have been simplified, I'm sure. But who has time to switch horses midstream? That's the right. other issue is trying to spool up manufacturing for an unknown versus a known quantity. Right. With a new cartridge, all new, you don't have your stockpile of ammo that you've been building for who knows how many decades. Yep. But I do think, especially with the Winchester 1907 after handling that thing, uh, that could have been very effective, especially early in the war when people really weren't sure of their footing. Uh, without the tactical advantage, the infantry advantage would have been really strong. Okay. I would take one of those over any of the major uh, combatant bolt actions. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ryan says, in the U.S., Mausers, SMLEs, Springfields, 1917 Enfields, and most Nagants are all over the place at gun shows and available on the Internet. But Monmouth 1895 seemed to be relatively rare. Austria was a major power with millions of troops in the field like everyone else. Is there some reason why so much less of their surplus got into the U.S. after the war? Um, from my perspective, there's a lot of these around, but yeah. they're all 9530s. Right. So they've been converted to 8x56. Did I just see one of those? Um, I have one around, oh, but I'm not sure it's on the wall. That's a, that's a traditional 18 Yeah, that's a nice one. There is... We want the crummy That's one. probably... That one's probably a pure 95 right there by the 1907. Yeah, but it looks pretty much Does the same. Does it have the S-shank? Let's see. Nope. No. That's a... a this is a World War One shop. Yeah. So this is this is an original carbine, but they like the pattern better than the long rifle, which is very unwieldy. Yeah. Um, and so they cut everything down to this, both in Austria and Hungary and in Bulgaria. So all three of them made the swap over to a larger, more powerful cartridge. And a, that's actually an interesting combination. Let's ramp up the power, add a Spitzer <laughs> bullet, and shrink it. Make the gun smaller. Uh, okay. These things kick like mules. Oh, it's... A lot of it's because of the domed butt plate. It doesn't actually... Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it comes to a peak at the rear of these things, so they hurt more than they should. <laughs> but I think part of the reason is a lot of these guns immediately went into post-war use with all of the countries that emerged from the wreckage of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing like the Balkans to just completely wipe out an entire arms production. Right. Like, just 
used into the ground, various civil wars, uh, unifications. Yep. Um, I mean, then Yugoslavia, and then it's not partisan like, Yugoslavia. Yeah. And then, I mean, just everywhere. It's not like a lot of the other countries where after the war, they all went into nice, clean arsenals and warehouses and eventually got surplus. No, these things got used. But still, plenty of the converted guns did show up. Yes. And then, but the second part, I think, is they use a cartridge that has never obtained any popularity here. There weren't a lot of U.S. troops in these regions in kind of an either war, comparatively right, speaking, to bring, them home. to bring them home as trophies. Like, that's why we have so many Arasakas. Over a million Arasakas just documented as souvenirs came back into the U.S. after World War II. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Most <clears throat> of the Austrian ones, like this one probably, I mean, a lot of the Austrian ones that are still in their original chamber in the 8x50 mm -hmm. is because that they were given as... Uh, repayment programs, especially to Italy. Right. Uh, after World War I, it's like, well, here's a bunch of guns in lieu of money. And then those countries did not do the upgrade programs. And then especially right. with, like, Italy. So a lot of the ones that you see actually in the original cartridge are because, well, we got into a fight with Italy, and therefore Britain and the U.S. took a bunch of them from Italy who had taken a bunch from Austria-Hungary. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Put that guy back. Next up, <clears throat> I think you need to do more Q and A's with a reference wall of guns because this comes in handy. It does. I can come back. <laughs> uh, Dale says, if the Entente was to standardize on one nation's arms for better logistics, which would have made the most sense? Oof. <clears throat> so France, U.S., Italy, England, U.K. In terms of, okay, so there's, there's a couple ways to think about this, but the number one thing that stands out to my mind is it would have to be a design that was currently produced in the U.S. Because that makes sense. The, just the sheer raw yeah. manufacturing power in a place that was not being bombed or threatened. So it would need to be something that was in production in the U.S. Among the guns that were available in the U.S., I think in bolt action terms would probably favor P14-1917. Okay. Now, um, to me, it's an obvious choice for 30 out 6 and the 19... 17. Is there any reason to go with a RIM 303 cartridge if you're going to standardize? No, it's only if we're talking about <clears throat> standardizing on a current member nation's cartridge, because I ditch any rimmed cartridge right away. Um, technically, there's on like there's technically you know members like Belgium who had 765 M Mauser. I probably might have favored that over 30 out six in this kind of conflict. A 1917 Enfield and 765. But then again, also you could get some of that length off because you're not having to deal with all the recoil. I know, there's, oh, the, we're playing the game oh, of building this. a yes, custom gun. Yes, and it would be a 1917 Enfield shortened into a, a short rifle or a carbine in 6.5 Carcano. You know, you, you yeah. laugh. No, it's, I want one of those now. No, of course, it would be Spitzer or Bottlenose because the Italians were still fielding Bottlenose. Even Bottlenose, I think, would be better than... I'd rather have a Bottlenose 6.5 Carcano than a 30-06. Yeah. 30 6 is a powerful cartridge, but you don't always need to... Now, the one advantage of 30 6 is the ability to defeat light armor in a trench situation, but that's only at range. In actual combat, like, getting into the trenches and moving... Can, can you imagine a Lewis gun in 6.5 Carcano? Oh. Again, I mean, there's special <laughs> roles. There's special roles for machine guns where they actually want to punch. And in yes. World War II, we do see them ramping up to punch harder. So, okay. maybe not. How about a BAR in 6.5 Carcano? Yeah, something like that would be pretty good. Yeah. But, regardless, um, I'm saying something in the Mauser family with the yeah. rear aperture sight is going yeah. to be very powerful. Um, uh, if we just say aperture sight rimless cartridge, yeah. that leads to that. The only answer then is the 1917 Enfield. Yeah. And, it, by the way, beautiful system once it was tooled mm -hmm. up for production and ready to roll. Yeah. So. Yeah, cool. I'd go that route. So would I. This was suggested, not this particular thing, but there are notes that uh, there were suggestions to go, the U.S. should go over to 303, and then okay. that way have a common cartridge. And sort of an early NATO idea, essentially. Yeah. Uh, that was poo-pooed immediately. And I, can't, I haven't even <laughs> been able to find the reasons why. It was just sort of like, why? They didn't even have reasons. Like, <laughs> yeah. Of course we're not doing that. No, we're Americans. Why do you think we threw them out right. 150 years before this? Uh, Dylan says, I've heard captioned Russian M95, Russian I have heard that Russian captured M95s were often fed with Russian 7.62x54 rimmed, and I've heard of Nagant's chambered for 8x50 Austrian. I find this thing fascinating. What other capture converted World War I rifles and calibers are there? 
There are a number. Um, I think we have, I'm not even going to reach for that, but we have a Belgian 1889 Mauser that was converted to 8mm Mauser from 765. Extremely easy conversion, which is yeah. why it was done. Yeah. Um, the more difficult the conversion, mm -hmm. the less often it was actually done. I mean, I've seen Mosins that were, you know, we could push it to this cartridge or that, we can push it to... Well, Bannerman had the 30 out 6 ones, that's not really the war. Yeah, but, these aren't wartime, and the, the 8mm Polish ones aren't wartime either. No. But the convert, the attempt to do that is it's a lot of work. And so it's easier to just go with captured ammo or to make the ammo in small batches because converting versus just cranking out some of the ammo or buying it somewhere or getting a hold of it somehow and then using it in the rear where it's not being consumed, way easier. And all you do is you free up a gun that was in the rear that uses your ammo and you put it up on the front line. Yeah. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of conversions from during the war, and I mean, if you want to reach back, you want to see a weird conversion. Um, it's not even a capture, it's an internal conversion. The Martini over beside you, that is just freaking weird. This guy? No, the Martini. Mm -hmm. uh, keep going, keep, this is the first tall one. I showed you this yeah. one. Oh, yes. This is actually from 1912, from before the war, because uh, the Ottomans were having trouble with the Balkan Wars, but this is a it's like Peabody Martini that was in, you know, 11 millimeter black powder. This has been converted to 765 in the US, we tend to call it Argentine, but it's the Belgian Mauser cartridge. Mauser. Yeah, so this is a smokeless powder, rimless <laughs> cartridge martini. It actually has a spring loaded ejection thing. I mean, it's really complicated in there to get this to happen. So, I mean, anything can happen. We certainly have, uh, there's even conversion guns from the Ottoman 1887s that are believed to have been converted by Bulgaria to 8 50 rimmed. We don't know. Uh, it's just believed that Bulgaria did it. We, we're not sure where they came from. We just know they exist. They seem to exist in the market, and it seems like maybe they came out of World War One. We're not sure. There were also some converted machine guns, especially some of the Maxims, because they are very easy to yes. convert. Yes. Oh, yeah. you swap the lock. You know, you do. Maybe you can basically a... drop in standard commercial parts, right. and make it into a different caliber without having to go through any of the sort of re-engineering. That might not even be a conversion in this case, though, because the Maxim was designed to be sold that way, so that you could just set it up for whatever country that you were selling it to. Right. I mean, it's conversion, but yeah. right, exactly. But, you know, we've heard of Lewis... That's why they did it, is because it was easy and reliable. We've heard about Russians, you know, converting Lewis guns to 7.62 and things like that. Um, the problem is you have to run down each of these claims. And off the top of my head, other than, like, the Belgian 89s and things like that where there's a pattern, right? it can be pretty hard to lock it in because the numbers we're talking about are usually below, like, 2,500 or something. At least some small number. In World War One terms, that's very that's small. That's nothing, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Next up, Redneck Tech says, Since we pretty much had developed all the various action types and pistols by about 1900, were there any attempts to develop an intermediate cartridge or a self-loader in anything other than like 30 out 6 or 8 LaBelle? It seems that between about 1890 and 1940, the world forgot they could make a cartridge any size they wanted to. I think we kind of covered this a little bit. Yeah, there were a few. Commercially um, available, but uh, most, you you, know, you should know this story. 351 mm -hmm. uh, turned into an 8mm for the... For the French. Yeah, for the Ribeiroi. That was uh, a whole concept. And it turned into a Spitzer bullet, experimentally, for the Americans with the Burton rifle. Yep. Um Nothing think, that really got fielded, though. I think a big part of this was the, the interchangeability of ammo between the rifles and the machine guns. Correct. And they didn't, like, it wasn't worth deprecating machine guns to have a, a, a lighter and more handier infantry rifle. And it definitely wasn't worth having two different cartridges to deal with. No, until you have fully automatic portable arms, sub, well, not even submachine guns now are a pistol cartridge, but we we got to get into around what you would call an assault rifle before people really start <laughs> to care about having a rifle cartridge that is not yeah. the same as the, the light machine gun or machine gun that they'd be carrying around. Yeah. Uh, next up, Andrew says, given its characteristics, would you consider, well, this actually is basically a follow-up question, would you consider the Winchester 1907-1910 to be one of the first true assault rifles, and how successful was it in military service? <clears throat> so here's the thing. It gets claimed to be an assault rifle because intermediate-style cartridge, light, automatic is where we get stuck up on that because I know from our friends at Cody that they did produce at least some trials models in full auto and I've seen claims by certain authors that the French and Russians bought them with select fire and I've been trying to track that claim down for it sounds like they really didn't I've been trying for two years to track down the claim 
there's some internal memos that sort of say the word automatic, but that could just mean semi-automatic. There's right. some decoded whatevers that came out to say rapid fire automatic, as if that means Maybe full that's automatic. Maybe some different kind, yeah. Yeah, and so <clears throat> I I don't know. I have yet to see if, if they made any sort of quantity, because thousands of those were made for the French, you know what I mean? And we see the no. magazines and other signs of them. You'd think if there was a bunch with select fire, there'd be a photo somewhere of one with a selector switch that wasn't a prototype sitting in the Winchester reference collection. You know what right. I mean? So, uh, Now, as for their... I, I will go on the record and say that thing is not an assault rifle. No. Um, for a combination of reasons. One, it's not select fire. Um, and two, the way that they were used... First off, they weren't used on the ground. They were used in aircraft, as we already touched on. But even if those aircraft guys had been using them on the ground, you don't have... The, the whole concept of assault rifle, as it's being referenced here, is about volume of fire. And you can't have that with two 10-round magazines. Yeah, you're trying to make it fit in the sense of the gun fits the pattern of assault rifle, but yeah. assault rifle is also a doctrine as yeah, well as exactly. a gun. And the Winchester doesn't fit it. Uh, let's see. Next we have Jerry... I'll give him the point. It could easily be converted to that. Like, yeah. some very short jumps. Right. But they didn't make those jumps. But they did. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Burton, actually, would have been one of the... Yeah, that double, arguably... Oh, yeah. There's, double stack magazine. There's an emphasis on volume of fire, on yeah. portability of ammunition, of shoot and move. No, yeah. that's the one to talk about. And they made two, I think. Well, you know, that's enough to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question is from Jerry. It says... Why did the rest of the warring powers not adapt the 10-round magazine like the British did with their SMLE? Did this not give them the advantage of not having to load their rifles half as often as most of everyone else's? Uh, funny thing is they still had five-round stripper clips because that's about as... Five, six rounds is where you run out of space to put in your pocket or pouch. Mm -hmm. um, a 10-round stripper clip, nobody wants that. And they aren't nearly as reliable to, to try right. and feed. So... Marginal by the tiniest sliver, possibly faster to load that magazine. Except also now you have to deal with ten rounds stacking in the magazine and more spring pressure. So maybe not even that. Generally, when tried, and there are countries that had larger or smaller uh, magazines. Like the Swiss had this with their uh, Gewehr eighteen eighty nine, and they went to like the K eleven and things like that, mm -hmm. or K G eleven and then K eleven things like that. Um, they just found that. On overall, when we have 30 men firing continuously, if we give them 100 rounds and we divide it up between 5 or 10, it doesn't seem to make any difference in terms of the overall volume of fire. And here's the other thing. If you have, let's say you want to time someone shooting 100 rounds, you're going to get basically the same time whether they have a 10-round mag or a 5-round mag because you will spend the same amount of... The difference will be your time loading 90 rounds versus loading 95 rounds into the magazine. And it doesn't really go any faster to do 10 at a time as opposed to doing five, shooting five, and then doing another five. So you kind of see this only when you're limiting it to like 10 rounds or 20 rounds maybe. Beyond that, you actually don't get a benefit to it. And then especially what you just said, when you add in the fact that you've got a bunch of other guys there. Right. Who are covering everyone who's reloading. And there is a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. uh, an extended magazine like that sticking out in the wind is prone to damage. I mean, mm -hmm. we've all seen old Lee Enfields. You have to be careful mm -hmm. to check that that magazine is going to feed when you buy one. Like mm -hmm. nowadays, that the wear is obvious. They can get dinged and danged. Um, the Lee Enfield is actually one of the most successful, not completely destroyed <laughs> extended magazines. But Usually when you have a magazine that sticks out of the rifle, it has to be very heavy reinforced steel yeah. in those days. Um, it just And then, by the way, uh, in terms of that capacity sticking down, you've lost your ability to go prone if you go too far with it. So, yeah, you don't get that with 10 rounds, but you definitely do get the potential to damage that magazine. Right. When was the last time you saw a Mauser with a damaged magazine that wouldn't feed right? Right. Like, you don't. Never. Yeah. So, uh, Daniel... Follow-up question, basically. Daniel says, I sometimes hear the SMLE referred to as a detachable box magazine rifle. However, I rarely see anyone ever loaded this way. How was ammo uh, issued and used with the SMLE in World War One? You know, we're back on magazines, and I thought of one other point from the previous question, so yeah. let me nail both <clears throat> real quick. The um, Another example, by the way, people talk about trench mags, 20-round trench yeah. mags. Nobody goes, 
No, he fights with those. Every time you see a photo of one of those, it's never a soldier it's holding sentry. it. They're always bolted into one of those periscope guns. Mm. Or a sentry. I've seen pictures of sentries. With that's them. true. But, but they're not, not the guys going over the top. No, it's not the people. Because the problem is you've got to dive. And once you dive, where is it going to go? There's, there's right. nowhere to sink that thing down. So you'll see it on periscope guns. You'll see it back behind the line. Yeah. But there's something to be said for the maneuverability of a five-round magazine being nice and tight to the rifle. Yeah. And then, um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to cover that one. And then we're talking about Smelly specifically yeah, in terms they, of changing the mag. They issued, like, bandoliers of magazines, right? Well, it was designed mm -hmm. to actually have two magazines. So what's the number two in here? And the idea was that you would have, first of all, you were supposed to have a magazine cutoff. It's the original long lead is what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And so you would have, in design only, you're going to single shot the gun until something happened that was bad, and then you would open the magazine, or you'd open the magazine cutoff, and then you'd rapid fire to clean up what break a breakthrough or whatever, and then uh, you could drop the mag, and it hung from a chain, and it would just hang off the gun. You pull your one spare mag and plug it in, mag cut off again, and we go back to single shot, and that way we can deal with up to two emergencies. And then after that, uh, we got problems because yeah. there was no charging back then, none of that right. stuff. So that was in design. <clears throat> Never actually released that way. They just ultimately ended up keeping them detachable for the sake of cleaning and maintenance. And because that's how the gun was already being built. Right. It's interesting. Inertia. It's interesting. Note when the U.S. Navy bought Remington, uh, was it Remington Lees? I think um, they did actually issue them with belts of four magazines, and they kind of did that. But that was the U.S. Navy, and they were in forty-five seventy, and I think there were four or five round magazines. Navies always tend to start thinking ahead of other <clears> stuff. Yeah. Uh, William says, if I recall, the British bought a bunch of Arasakas from Japan during World War One. Were they ever fielded? Like, why? What did the British do with Arasakas? Uh, mostly naval use. They did produce ammunition. They filled roles basically off the front line, drill, naval use, things like that. A lot of port guarding because you don't want saboteurs in there and things like that. Um, you see, you see, this kind is, of, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is exactly what we talked about a few minutes ago with, with the conversions. Of oh yeah. Buy some ammo, buy some rifles, give them to someone who's not really going to use them, but has to be armed. And then all of the navies, Lee Enfields can go to the front. Yeah. And by the way, it would have been a cinch to convert to 303 on those guns, I believe. Like not perfect, yeah. but they could take the stress of it. There's room in the receiver. You would have had to modify the <laughs> bolt though. Why bother? We yeah. can just make some ammo. Um, now, where the Arasaka saw a lot of use is it was like the second most common rifle and very close to the same issue numbers for a while before production really geared back up. Um, Russia. Yeah. Russia had tons of Type 38s, Type 38 carbines, and Type 30 rifles from Japan. Leftovers from the Russo Japanese War, but they also bought them and took them in on aid because yeah. they were being surplused out because Japan was doing just fine. <laughs> they had tons of rifles. So uh, 6.5 would have been very common in Russia, which is why we see it involved in the development of a certain auto-loading rifle. Right. Yeah. A cool auto-loading rifle. Someday I'll get a chance to shoot that. Alrighty. Next question is from Jeff, who says, what were some of the popular field modifications the troops applied to their firearms? Um, court martial. <laughs> yes. People think this is a thing. Um, a lot of this, by the way, is twofold. Uh, the old version of this, the FUD version of this, is uh, my pappy's gun, and he carved his name into it, and blah, blah. Like, pappy didn't want the neighbor stealing his gun, number one. And by the way, nine times out of ten, when pappy said this was my gun, when pappy says this was my gun in the war, everyone assumes... This was his personal gun that when he left, they said, you had a good war, here's your gun, <laughs> goodbye. No, okay, Pappy may have had a Winchester in the war. It's not that one. Right. <laughs> he just bought it surplus later and went, that's the one I had in the war, I'm going to buy one of those. And then later and he goes, this is the gun, pattern of gun I had in the war, not and the exact. By the way, Pappy's always loved that ambiguity. They do that <laughs> crap on purpose, don't fall for that crap. And then they carved their name in there. So Bill, who's always borrowing stuff and never get it back, I put Pappy on here so <laughs> Bill can't keep it. And by the way, they're equally likely that Pappy had one of these in the war. 
Oh yeah, yeah. but it's, it's a shotgun. Yeah. No, so you got a shotgun. The notoriously like that's that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Nah, 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 nah. But if you're watching this and you're a total gun nerd, that does not mean that everyone who's issued a gun in a war is also a gun nerd, or even that they have any even remote tiny interest in any of the details of their gun. Oh yeah, it's a tool. I mean, some of them yes, and hopefully they all ended up in the develop R and D development Look, side of things. I think but. I think a majority of your audience is probably male, mm -hmm. probably interested in military. Mm -hmm. Go to the nearest makeup store and just. Just eyeball everything that's a, a cylindrical tube this big and tell me which one is lip gloss and which one's eyeliner from four feet away. <laughs> and that is what Pappy knows about his... Because it's the, probably the yeah. only full-size rifle he was ever given. Right. He sees something that looks even remotely like it. Anyway, sorry. That's a separate issue. Modification. Probably <clears throat> practically none, and if you got caught doing it, it had been your butt. Yeah. The, the guns were almost more valuable than men in most armies. In fact, there are a couple... The exceptions are really notable. And right. they're not World War One exceptions. The one that comes to mind is the Boer War. Yes. The well, Boers carved all sorts of cool, elaborate stuff. Oh, and sometimes just garbage crap, but sometimes really elaborate, interesting things in their rifles. And they did it because they were all their own personal guns. Or you have things like Partisans or like, you know, yeah. Yugoslav, Chetnik, whatever. Again, though, you have a less organized, not full state. Right. And then, by the way, once they become a full state, that stuff knocks off real quick. You don't see that on later pattern guns because all of a sudden states spending tax money on it, they don't want you messing with it. I'm, I'm not 100% on the details of this because it's something that I'm hoping to go look at. But up in Canada, one of the museums has this SMLE from World War I that is completely and very intricately like reliefing, relief carved, all the wood. And it's beautiful. And it's something that a soldier did in the field and got court-martialed for, but the gun was so nice that they kept it and put it in the museum, but that did not prevent them from throwing him in the brig. Uh, no, uh, I will say, to talk <clears throat> about field modifications, I have handled, uh, not field mar modification, but uh, armory modification, which is where modification <clears throat> happens at the armory level. Yeah. Uh, the Springfield uh, 1903 well, you know, bolt-action <clears throat> rifle and then what we think of as 1903 is really more like a 1905 slash six. Right. Um, but this was then serial number one, and it made it all the way to France in World War One before huh. a field armorer said, this is serial number one, and sent it back. And it had every upgrade done to it by then. No rod bayonet, no nothing left on it. So that's... Huh. They're not that sentimental about these guns, right. but again, you don't get to touch it. We get to ruin right. it. Um, the only other exception I can think of is a World War II thing, and that's the Stingers. I could say, if we're going to World War II, Italians, they mm -hmm. tended to do casing art on their guns. They would okay. just kick out hot casings and rub them in to get patterns. Mm -hmm. That seems to have been a thing, as far as I can tell. I don't Unless that was just a universal rural thing immediately post-war, but I doubt it. Yeah. Um, anyway. All right. Uh, next up, we have Tyler, who says, What was the most significant lesson learned about firearms design during World War I? My answer would be the shift from prim focusing primarily on marksmanship and accuracy to appreciating, benefit of, appreciating the benefit of volume of fire. What say you, Lothias? <sighs> volume of fire was probably something that they picked up on pretty tight. Um, only it seems more ascribed to the machine gun, though. Like, you don't, you don't see it as much in other realms, except for Germany goes on a universal machine gun hunt. Everybody mm -hmm. else goes on a light machine gun hunt. And then and the submachine guns. guns. That's probably the big one, is personal personal mobile firepower goes up, which is what he's talking about in terms of volume of fire. Right. That is where that volume of fire thing kicks in. And he's specifically asking about firearms design. Right. The design side, though, simplicity of manufacturing. I think what they started to finally understand is how to effectively make self-loading rifles that were militarily reliable. How right. to go from... Commercial stuff like this, yeah. that's awesome, but you don't want to field strip that in the trench. I almost feel like this is the inkling in World War I, but it really does take another decade. It takes a while before we see it in self-loading rifles, but you see it in submachine guns. True. Like this idea of, you don't need a locking system. You can have a tube and a big cylindrical bolt and a magazine. And just let it slam back and forth. See, that's my biggest takeaway from World War One, though, yeah. is mass production. Okay. Mass. There were simplifications, but really, when you start to see an MP18 
And then they start saying stamp steel was the next big thing and only simplified in World War II. It's like, by the end of World War I, they had started figuring out that they could make stuff out of crud and it would still run. Um, that was probably the most important lesson in terms of large-scale warfare. What maybe muddies that is that they didn't then act on it. No. Because they then the war ended, and if you could build crap. But if you don't have to, why would you? And well, so not only like that, but you have surplus everywhere. Right. So they went back to continuing to make nice guns because you can. Right. And it wasn't until World War II when things got really desperate and people went, you know what? Remember, it doesn't have to be this nice. <laughs> uh, let's see. We've got two more here. Uh, next one is Kyle. What is your favorite carbine of the First World War? I know there are a lot of choices, but I'd go with a Serbian Mauser 1908. It is svelte, handy, and chambered in one of the milder rounds of its day, the 7mm Mauser. I actually love the 7mm Mauser cartridge. Uh, it's a pleasant shooter. And then that is a very weird pick, by the way. Um, most esoteric. people are not aware that there was a Serbian 1908. It's probably one of, if yeah. not the rarest possible gun that you could pick from World War One. Where so could I he don't maybe, think where could he have maybe have seen a video on said rifle? A chance. Well, it hasn't been released yet. But, hasn't it? Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe by the time of this thing. But um, yeah, I can't imagine where anybody would ever lay their hands on one of the rare... Thank you, by the way, John Clear, for learning these things. <laughs> um, yeah, these are handy little suckers. Yeah. They are really nice. And if I had to pick a bolt-action car, I mean, this is pretty high up there on the list. So uh, this, or I could even say, like, a mod like a Schoenauer carbine, those are fantastic five-round shots, smoother than this gun, okay. and I do not hate a 6.5 bottle nose any more than you do. Um, so maybe, like, a Greek mod like a Schoenauer or something like this would work just fine for me. Type 38 carbine? Uh, also an extremely good gun, and one of my favorites in terms of being buttoned down for water and mud proof. However, not quite a cock on, 90% cock on close, a little 10% cock on open, and the cock on close is not that smooth. It's okay. the one thing I don't like about those guns is that if you're trying to rapid fire, they really want to push off the target more than some others. That's true. But otherwise, extremely superior. And I take it over a standard, you know, Mauser carbine in many ways in terms of sheer reliability. 6.5. It's a carbine. It's yeah, if it weren't for the problems with the end block clips themselves, like not always being perfect, that is extremely light and extremely handy and underappreciated. I mean, it's not... Underappreciated, but I think the Mauser is better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Naturally, of course, that is the actual original World War One version with the cool World War One version of Bayonet. Oh, that one's got the cavalry switchy switch. That was a limited thing, so yeah. it's pretty cool. All right, and our last question is from Ed, who says, out of all of the forgotten, rare, unusual World War One weapons you've gotten your hands on, which one would you take into combat? And he says, why would it still be the MP-18 or the RSC? But... I'll let you go first. Because you have a looser understanding, so I'm going to tip my hand too much. <laughs> um, honestly, I would be tempted by the RSC as long as I had knew I had a good logistical trail of clips. Right. Because I think eats clips, in my experience. My limited but real experience is that those clips are pretty much disposable. One time use. Yeah. Um, boy, I wasn't even thinking about my own answers. I'd, I'd have to ask you. Yeah. Um, uh, he's not wrong with the MB-18. Uh, I would say, though, that is hedged by the fact that I now have one in my hands and I'm having some time to actually play with one. Mm -hmm. And I'm coming to some conclusions about how that gun is not as simple as you think in terms of handling. Um, there is a sleeve that fits over the magazine. Yeah, the magazines are such an albatross for that thing. Well, so there's a sleeve that fits over the magazine and everything's over as a spacer. I actually suspect that you're supposed to load the magazine and then thumb that spacer forward because you can overfeed the mag and it will jam up the gun hmm. in ours but ours is a rebuild so i need to go play with some snap caps and some museum pieces in the future to confirm this but everything seems to say insert magazine grab pull mag back out shove forward and it sets up and then it runs like a top so that's hmm. a bit of a lot of handling even though you are getting the submachine gun um if we're looking at oh you know i could count on your opinion, possibly, there is another very forgotten submachine gun. Do you have any opinion on a certain Italian design? Are you talking about the OVPs? Yes. Yeah. I've handled one in a museum. The problem is I've never shot one. I've shot one. It has an extremely high rate of fire. Right. It was kind of finicky. 
In mm. fact, it didn't run all that well. But then again, it's a hundred year old weird submachine gun. And loads and who yeah. Um magazine has a big open slot on the back, which is Conceptually though, very strong runner. Um yes, conceptually. Uh really weird cocking system. Oh, like, just it's got a pump pull, pull. sleeve on it that's it's very fantastic. with a locking button on the bottom that's kind of weird and awkward to get used to. I, I found that thing um, most comparable to the Browning Auto Twenty Two, in <laughs> terms of feel. Just pick it up and be like, "What am I? What am I holding here?" That said, it doesn't have the weird balance issue of the MP18. It is overall, the, namely, you know, thirty rounds right. hanging way out on the side. It doesn't have the magazine weirdness feeding issues that you're talking about. It's a much lighter gun overall, and it's better balanced. <sighs> That would be a really strong contender. Yeah. You know, just <laughs> if I don't have a crew to load the magazines for me, that might put me over the edge for the Beretta or for the OVP. Right. Because that's a double stack, double feed traditional magazine and it's blip, 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 really easy to load. As opposed to that Luger Trommel drum that is like, if you lose your tool, just shoot yourself. The problem with naming a forgotten weapon, by the way, is there's never any data on how well they actually perform. Right. Like, the, yeah. we're basically dreaming. Because yeah. then I can go, well, Fedorov off to Matt because I have a select fire. What it, but when you actually pull the trigger, what the heck does it do? Yeah. And so that's kind of How did I forget about that one? That would actually be more, honestly, the Fedorov might be more compelling to me than the RSC. You actually handled one of these. I have not. Yeah, I've never fired one, but I've handled it. And I kind of like the handling. It's but a handy rifle. How many things have you handled that you liked, and then you know, something goes? You, you that never absolutely I, happens. You yeah. always got to pull the trigger. Which one would do that on our show as much as possible? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so well, that's a good one to round out on, right? We'll both run around with uh, Fedorovs and OVP 1918s. I, if I was actually drawn in the war, would be picking stuff that was very well proven. <laughs> yeah, uh, like Chester 1907. Yeah, very, very high contender. Better than a bolt action, but you're pretty darn sure it'll actually work. I mean, technically some FN 1900s made in there, and I've had a lot of luck with that in the Remington 8, although I think a little more susceptible there than I like. Yeah. But what a little work. But again, this is all a conjecture. In the long run, I would take a good, reliable bolt action in that period with what autoloaders were doing. Enfield 1917. Yeah. All right. There it is. Um, so, uh, thank you to everyone on Patreon who made this possible. It's you guys that supply the questions. I, like I said, I didn't want to spoil, give away what we were doing here because we have a big project that we are working on. <laughs> I don't think I've ever spent so much money in my life, let alone uh, it's everything an expensive else. Expensive project too. Yeah, um, a lot of ammo. It, a lot of machine guns go through a lot of ammo, which costs a lot of money. Yeah. So, so we spend a lot of days in the sun when we're not done. We're we're done filming this. We right, we have to film go do something else. Of that now. And then now we got to make up some time to film some other things. To oh my god, this is a nightmare. You want to tell people anything about uh, this? Yeah. Um, at this point, it's probably pretty it clear a that a couple little teasers out we've there. We've gotten our hands on like every light machine of the war and most of the auto rifles. Yeah. So basically, I mean, everything up to the rarity of a Fedorov, we have. Yes. Um, that's pretty much the only thing that I could name. And again, I don't know that it saw any sort of standard issue. I, oh, God, no, it didn't. Right. And so everything we have, at least, so if it saw a standard issue, yeah. and it's arguably a light machine gun, it's... We it's, got it. Yeah. It be here. So that was, it was too much of a, a uh, convalescence of, of things that it was like, Ian, get over here. This is the <laughs> chance to do this. So um, there's a lot of content coming. Yes. Uh, you will be seeing the results of that project over the course of about a month. And it will be on both channels. Half of it will be on Forgotten Weapons, and half of it will be on CN Arsenal. So, I'm assuming none of us catch fire or die between them. True. It's what? not quite all filmed yet. No. I, Although it will be by the time people we have see a this. Very tiring day. I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, big thank you to all of you for tuning in. If you haven't watched anything on CN Arsenal, you should definitely head over, check it out. Matthias's depth and research is fantastic. Uh, and hopefully, I'll come back and do some more collaboration with you again in the future. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for watching. Bye.